Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Eby, and I'm uh, one member of the Bold Crew. So I'm sure Harris and Jason are around here somewhere. Harris at the back there. So um, thank you, uh, Somerset House, and thank you for everybody um, to turn up for this conversation. Uh, the, the title of tonight's uh, event is The Stories of Our Style. And uh, it sits really neatly alongside the missing thread. Um, and so whilst con uh, conceiving the exhibition and the idea, many of our discussions uh, were about voices and communities that are missing, um, conversations around people that are missing, um, or misplaced even, or just in the wrong place. Um, and some are just fully lost. So I think conceptually the exhibition draws on a broad variety of creative practice spanning generations and amplifying a broad spectrum of black identities and perspectives. So um, that's the thing that the exhibition is really trying to center on and feature on. Um, so with this in mind, I have two exceptional talents, beings, humans, um, design thinkers, um, separated by generations, but practicing elite menswear as a central motive with the fashion industry as a backdrop. Because I think that's important to note that the fashion industry, often for black people, is a backdrop to our practice and to our, and to our work. So there's never really been a moment when we've been fully included in that conversation. So that, I think that's one thing to note, that there's a backdrop. So this, this, uh, this guy over here in the green and white, in the Nigerian colors, I'm going to say, is uh, celebrating over 25 years in fashion. Oswald Boateng conceived... I, I'm going to stop you there. It's a bit longer than that. Is it? Yeah. All right. This is it's what was on the website. I thought it was, you yeah, know, It's Oswald. a bit longer than that. The store is there on Savaro for 30 years. Oh, so the store... I know it started in the early 80s, so it's getting a little closer right. to 40. So we say 40 little, years. A little right? correction. So, so let me rewind. So celebrating... He's nearly, a youngster. He's a ne youngster. <laughs> nearly 40 years in fashion, Oswald Boateng conceived a new silhouette and palette for international menswear, creating a concept of style and luxury for men not previously envisaged, envisaged but desired by men everywhere. Uh, always the revolutionary, Oswald Boateng's collections now see an evolution into women's wear and lifestyle. So beyond men's wear, now doing something more. And I note that you're, you're now doing chairs as well, right? So that's a, another deviation from the line. Um, previously holding the position of creative director at Givenchy, Om, he began making bespoke suits in the 1980s and is widely credited with introducing Savile Row tailoring to a new generation. In 1994, he was the first tailor to stage a catwalk show in Paris during Paris Fashion Week. So that's some accolade. And in 1996, winner of the Best Menswear Designer, um, wins the award for best menswear designer at the Trophée de la Mode in Paris. So um, I think we have to give him a bit of a, a cheer for that, or a bit of a clap. Okay, so next to me um, is Bianca Saunders, recipient of the Career Defining Andom Award 2021. Bianca Saunders graduated at the Royal College of Art in Menswear in 2017, launching her eponymous brand. Saunders first made her Fashion Week debut at the Spring Summer 19 London shows, quickly becoming the one to watch. Her work explores modern masculinity with garments designed to give an individual experience to each wearer. As Bianca Saunders has a subtle touch of flavoring related to her British Jamaican heritage, an ambiguity that invites unbounded self-expression in the wearer. One of her key signatures is to capture a garment that appears to be permanently in motion. Um, could we have a, a, a bit of a cheer for Bianca as well? Okay, so I've, I'm gonna call this first part of the conversation trailblazing. Um, so separated by nearly 30 years, you were both considered trailblazers. Oswald, were you aware of the significance of your work and your personal presence in the industry? You know, all that time ago, um, at that time, at that point, it's worth noting that Nelson Mandela was still in jail. 
So, so again, there's this, this sort of social backdrop um, that really, you know, is the backdrop to your work as well. So were you aware of what you were doing, the significance of your work at that point? Right, right at the very beginning, or yeah, let's, let's go all the way back to 87, 87, 88, no, 90. No, I, it was clear because obviously I grew up in London in the 70s, right? And so, um, uh, in the early 80s, we had the race riots, I think you remember that, and then there wasn't many, uh, sort of uh, black role models that you'd see. I mean, there were a few, and the only few there were were, were Nelson Mandela, who was actually. When did he get out of prison? What year was that? 94. Yeah, so he was still in prison. Uh, Muhammad Ali was another. I mean, Michael Jackson was kind of in and out of that as well. And, uh, and then Lenny Henry was the only person on TV at, back then. So there was not a lot of reference points. So for me, you know, my family, my father was very political. He taught me a lot about what, politics, particularly in Africa and independence. So there was a very profound leader called Kwame Nkrumah, who, uh, basically helped Africa get its independence, you know, sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, so that was the sort of backdrop. So in the early 80s, um, I was starting computer, computer programming because I thought it was the future. Of course, I was wrong. <laughs> and, and, and then um, uh, I kind of found myself on this path in design. But it came very clear to me very early on because my dad always wore suits and suits uh, were always this sort of layer of respectability. And I grew up in London at a time where they had that sus law, I think you remember it, right? Where you could you know, get stopped and searched by the police at any given time, and they'd empty your pocket. So growing up with that as a backdrop, I thought, look, I needed something which creates a layer. And my father had told me looking respectable was a way of doing that. So then once I understood that that was gonna be the tool that I would use, then I realized that Savaro was also another important component. So I think uh, I saw my first collections when I was like 18, 19 years old. And then uh, a friend of mine said to me, go down to Savaro. You know, Savaro is an important place, blah, blah, blah. I said, that's for the dusty old man. Why do I want to go down there? <laughs> but so uh, I went down there and met a famous potato there called Tommy Nutter. But that kind of shaped my mindset because I realized the value of the street, because I was designing collections at that time. In those days, Covent Garden was the spot to be. So, but I suddenly realized the opportunity of being able to redefine what the street means and being a part of it looking the way I do. So that became the mission at uh, 18, and it was achieved in sort of like my mid to mid-20s. Yeah, because you started pretty young, really. So the computer programming lasted for what, like two weeks? I actually it lasted a year. I actually knew the, pro, the, the code. It's funny, I had a client of mine said, you know, um, came in who uh, is really big in technology. So he, basically his software company designed I, iCloud. And uh, we were talking about it and I said, oh, you know, I, I, I studied BASIC, which is 0011. He was like, what? How old are you? Yeah, so, um, but yeah. And Bianca, I mean, um I mean, you're sometime later, right? So, and you're treading a unique path because you're a black woman deconstructing and reconfigurating the kind of the role of modern black masculinity in menswear. Um, so how did your design direction take shape and how comfortable were you exploring black male identities? Um, well, it's, well, I guess it's quite interesting. When I first started doing menswear, I was like, I kind of dabbled in it a little bit throughout my BA degree. And I was a bit like, mm, maybe I'm making something that might be a bit too obscure for what men would traditionally wear. And then I guess at the time, it was like London Collections men. So there was designers like Craig Green and like Ashton Anderson that were really like changing things in terms of what um, men's fashion looked like. Um, and, and I think for that, for me, that, that sparked something. And then, of course, um, I got into my third year, and I had Andrew as my tutor, which was like very much inspiring Serendipity. for me to see in someone who is a, a, a black man that is just very creative, like very much like when people hear him, they actually listen. And it was something that I really wanted to be able to achieve within fashion and just have like a lot of knowledge. Um, and then I guess I... S at Somerset House um, in, I think it was like 2014 and 2013, they had an exhibition called Return of the Rude Boy. 
and that really encapsulated the the car like the the black and also British experience of like the rude boy subculture and I think it just had something with me where it was just like well I'm able to see like the Caribbean experience encapsulated in some in a building like this and that means that I can probably explore my identity within fashion which I felt before it was a bit more like maybe it's a little bit too political or this is something that shouldn't be explored. Um, and I guess it was how I see knocking on the door of Andrew's office and be like, I've got a question. Do you think this is right? Do you think I could call myself Bianca Saunders because I'm a woman and I'm creating men's work? And he was like, well, the being West is called being Westwood. And I was like, for me, he said that. And I was like, okay, then that, that's made things really click. Um, I was really interested in like tailoring i think just deconstructing it and just like figuring out exactly like how a man's body is built up on on like rebuilding a shape of it being masculine and um a lot of my friends that are around me really inspired me so interviewing them and like asking them questions about their masculinity and like whether it didn't necessarily exist in like um what they wore but more their gestures and body language might be a little bit more feminine and how to kind of encapsulate that in clothes um and then it was more of an exploration, and then I guess people um, was like, your work's about exploring masculinity, and I was like, okay, yeah, it is. So, but it was more about me showing a different side to it that um, made people feel a bit more like themselves. Yeah, and those first kind of shows or installations, those video, that video work you did, um, really was capturing that emotion that, that I mentioned a bit earlier. So that early stage of, um, I suppose, trying to kind of break into the game. Did, did you see your work going in that way? Because you also describe yourself kind of as an artist or a visual artist as well. So was that on the table or was it always going to be clothes? Um, originally, I, I wanted to be an artist. Um, and I guess my uncle kind of ruined that for me. He was like, oh, you'll never be like that successful until like you're like gone. And I was like, oh, that's, that sounds, sounds really bad to me. <laughs> but, um, and then I, like fashion, it was just a way to kind of like bring it all together. You're able to research, you kind of like create the concepts and collaborate with people a bit more. Whereas of course in, in being an artist, you can do that. But I feel like fashion is a bit more like about collaboration and it's about bring, bringing people together essentially. Um, so I think that's kind of where it, it is, but I think, the Royal College of Art experience really helped me push that because the first week wasn't allowed to make anything. So I was just like, I kind of panicked and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And then I started creating these films and it, that became my research, which I'm still like kind of going back to that all the time and um, looking forward on. So the next part is about finding a way. And I've had a conversation, I think, with Oswald a few times about finding a way. So the political backdrop and the challenge of the time we've spoken about, um, just briefly anyway, we could speak about that all night, mm. but how did you find a way? I mean, it, it, it's like that, that start point, you know, how did you find that road and how did you strategize, you know, that, that you know, yeah, the I triumph? Mean, yeah, I mean, I touched on it. I mean, it, the, you know, the backdrop was, <clears throat> you know, I mean, there were race riots in the beginning of the eighties. So that kind of says everything based on frustration and not being heard. And so uh, there was kind of two roads back then. Either you got really angry and, you know, or you decided to, to, to make a difference in the way that you could. And so that's why I decided. And so uh, finding myself on the Savile Row wasn't an accident. You know, like I said, at that time, Covent Garden was a much more commercial move and I was known as a designer as opposed to a tailor. And so uh, it would have been smarter to do that. And in fact, you know, uh, even Susie Menkes has is, is, is said to me, you know, that was, I'm not sure that was a grown move for you because you know, you're doing these shows. You know, you've got a lot of uh, uh, traction around your brand in, in, in Paris. Why are you narrowing the position as a tailor? So um, no, but I chose it because I knew the importance of being on that street called Sabah Row and communicating it globally, being me. And then also redefining the suit, which you know, no one will, uh, I think, take away from the influence I've had on that. And I think that was hitting a much bigger narrative, right? You know, the, the bigger narrative is, okay, if you've been judged by the way you look, what happens when you contribute? 
And when you contribute, what does that mean? Right? And so uh, I knew by being that street, it would inspire other people. And, and that it was based on the quality of the work. I mean, I think we, I mean, we all remember, you know, seeing this, this black tailor on Savile Row. It's this guy, you know, and it's like, and then learning your name and then, you know, as an influence of someone coming after you. So I, I graduated in 96. Um, you'd already had your first shows. Um, so for us, that was a, so seeing someone there was a really important um, part of the development of any designer. Um, seeing you on Savile Row, that was, was, that was something different. And I think that for us was a, as a moment that we could really, we could really grab onto something. Um, and I think this is what's interesting about this conversation. In many ways, you know, I learned from yourself and I had the opportunity to work with Joe Casley Hayford. And then that kind of knowledge was passed on to me and then passed on to Bianca as well. Exactly. So there's this really lovely kind of synergy that's happening. Um, Bianca, in terms of your challenges, because it's a, it's a different time, um, but there are still challenges. Um, you know, your references often have very strong cues of heritage and culture. Um, so, I mean, you know, and, and that kind of observation. So, you know, how do you think your work is kind of decoded and understood in, in, a, in a kind of a mainstream way? Is that something that you're concerned with or you think about? You know, so to your immediate audience, you know, and looking around and a lot of us really probably understand your work, but how do you feel about the challenge of breaking the mainstream, let's say? Um, I think I think when I started my brand, it came at like an interesting time because like two years in, I guess um, after that it was COVID, so like everything was about being pushed pu being pushed online, and I was always much an internet person. So I like throughout like me doing my degree, I was on Instagram. I was like um, sharing myself with stylists and like seeing exactly who could like borrow my clothes and all the rest of it. So I think the power of the internet has really changed. Um, I guess. It's my experience. Um, of course, it definitely has been hard and that sort of stuff, but um, there was an era of where, I guess it was Black Lives Matter, and I think that's when people started to realize, oh, she's a black woman, like, because I didn't really put myself on on my Instagram as much, um, and people just thought, I was just using those black people, I don't know <laughs> what they thought. But um, yeah, I think that really ha has helped um, kind of like shape things and also break those barriers down. Um, but I think in terms of like my identity and that sort of stuff, I've realized that there's not one way to tell a story. Like the, um, there's quite a few other like black designers and then you're seeing the difference between like someone's story is like one way. They might be also Jamaican, also um, Caribbean, also British, but they might tell their story in a different way and they might be looking more of a historical context and like, so many designers have been able to tell like who they are. I was watching, um, or years ago, I was watching the Marjolaine documentary, and a lot of his work was about his upbringing. So his mum was a hairdresser, and like that sort of thing. But people don't really realise that most designers' experiences are about their own, and why can't black people be allowed to tell their own experience? Agreed. Um, and and I, I I think it's the right time. There's this, there's this kind of groundswell of interest. Um, in culture, really. It's always been there, but there's a, I guess there's a kind of a new visual that we can see, and social media has also helped to provide that platform too. Um, my next part, my next question is really about this, this concept of missing. Now, when we look at Oswald, I'm not sure if Oswald is, is really missing uh, from the story. Uh, I'd say he's very present, to be fair. Um, but there are narratives around Oswald that I think are missing. And the thing that the bold picked up on and, and the missing thread picked up on was your years in Paris as creative director of Givenchy. Um, so, I mean, around this observation of missing, I mean, how was that period? Because, again, you're trailblazing. The year is kind of, is it 2000 and...? Uh, 2002 to, like, 06. I was as usual. She does. I mean, the thing is, in Paris at this time, you know, uh, definitely I was having a huge influence. You know, a lot of designers were looking at my work, and you know, I mean, I'm not going to run off the list of designers that were were coming to my store on Savaro, but it was a lot of them. And so, no. So, if, the, interesting enough, I had got offered um, a creative director role prior to Givenchy. 
one of the big houses. And at the time, it was at the back end of the 90s. And uh, at the time, I was thinking, how am I going to split myself to do my collection and also do it for in, in Paris? And so I kind of like sabotaged the opportunity, right? And then, um, and then I realized that uh, that was kind of a mistake. Because, uh, because, I, because I was very known for being that very slim silhouette to tailoring. You know, right until I started, the silhouette was very baggy, very loose. Armani was effectively the dominant menswear designer, right? So that silhouette was it. Uh, and so my intent from the moment I started was uh, Armani took the structure out of tailoring. I was going to put the structure back in. So that was my narrative. That was my vision. That was a focus. And that's exactly what happened. But then, you know, you, you get your silhouette and then you aspire the designers and then, you know, they put a few hundred million dollars behind their marketing and suddenly, you know, the position moves. And so I learned from that. So when the opportunity came to me uh, in the early 2000s, which was quite interesting because I, um, I did a big fashion show on Savile Row. I closed it. Uh, so it was like, uh, yeah, it was actually 2002. And I um, did this huge show, it was a huge turnout, and then a thousand people, whatever it was. And then, um, so that was it, went really well. Invited my dad, he met the mayor, it was all, all that high glamour. So then I get invited to this party, which is Vuitton Classics, and you do it once a year. You know, usually I'm on table maybe 58 or whatever it was, but this time I'm on table one. So like, what's going on here? Yeah, so, let's go. So I kind of end up on this table, and, uh, and I meet this uh, really amazing guy called Yves Cassel, who was the president of Vuitton at the time. And uh, he's there with his wife, and his wife says, oh, you know, um, he would like to get a suit. So, great, sure, you just go down to Savaro, no problem, you know, we'll make you a suit. Anyway, I'm sitting with a PR woman, and she says, oh, you know, um, we did an event at the same time you did an event. I said, oh, really? He says, you know, you kind of emptied our event. <laughs> I was like, what? What do you mean? And, like, and she was kind of like pissed off at me. I was like, and it was quite funny. Um, and so I was like, what? No, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm buying my people. That's, you know. But anyway, I ended up going to, uh, oh, that was a, a part, part of that story is, so the Vuitton Classic thing ends. We exchange details. I go back to my office and I say to my guys, you want to believe that they want to, they want me to make the Yves Cassel the suit. And that's quite wild, but sure. But they want me to go to Paris. I'm not going to go to Paris to make him the suit. You should come here. They're like, no, Oswald. It's not about the suit. He just wants you to come to Paris. <laughs> so anyway, and so anyway, I end up going to Paris. He, and he says, if he takes you on the balcony, he's going to offer you a job. And so he took me on the balcony. <laughs> and then it's like, oh. And then, it's, and then he, um, he offered me uh, a couple of op opportunities. The first one I, I, I looked at, I couldn't do it because it affected you moving to Paris. And then eventually we decided it was in Givenchy. So the Givenchy experience was interesting because, you know, when you're running your business here, you know, as a Brit designer, and I say Brit designer because you have to have multiple skills. You've got to be a designer and you've got to also understand business. You've got to understand, I mean, you've got to have the ability to, to understand maybe 50 different jobs, right? So there I am in this seat and I allow, all I have to do is focus on one. So, um, so it was a real kind of uh, treat to be able to indulge myself with all those toys, you know? And so, um, but of course I couldn't switch my business mind off and, you know, I remember the, the way they need to construct their collection. Um, I, I meet you for, that's a lot of waste of money because, you know, for me, it's every penny was my sure. penny. Sure. So uh, I kind of reframed the collection to the extent I said 25% of their production costs before wow. I even started. Wow. Because that's what you learn when you lose money, you see, for many years. <laughs> you know how to save money, right? But uh, yeah, so, um, so we started that show and then I thought I needed to you know, be creative. So I've been making short films for years and so I did the animation which sits uh, in your the, space. The animation, yeah. and, and the reason why I did the animation because my, I'm known for color, right? But then I didn't want to give my color code to Givenchy, that's Oswald Botang. So I wanted to create a different palette. And so I created a very muted palette. 
but I thought what I would do is, is I wanted to still make you think color without seeing it. So then I decided to uh, make this animation, which I was known for doing film. I thought I'd make an animation which is rich in color, effectively telling the story of how I got the job. Right. Yeah, we, we love that. Like, you know, when we were trying to find Oswald, we were like, yeah, but we've seen that Oswald Botang, we've seen that Oswald Botang, but the animation, it was quite hidden. Um, and I, I thought it really spoke a lot about your work and also that introduction to Paris, but also bringing the flavor to Paris. Um, yeah, I mean, also, it also, you know, if you see the animation, it, it shows you. Like, you know, uh, my skill is what got me the job, right? And then you can see I open a vault and there's a history of the house, right? And the history of the house is, you know, that's my training. Is It's not about uh, cutting away from it. It's about kind of respecting it and finding ways to evolve with it. And the language used, because I do the voiceover on it, I say, if you, you know, if you flow with history, man, you know, it can become a dance. So once you come to dance, then, then, you're, then you're in rhythm with it, you see? And then involving becomes very interesting. That room's going to be packed later. No, <laughs> that, that room, yeah, there's, a, there's a small room that's going to be packed. Um, Bianca, um, within the exhibition, there's a real exploration of, of um, black women in fashion, and, or really the lack of um, visibility of black women in fashion. And within the show, we've had to borrow from um, a lot of our... Um, practitioners have come from art spaces uh, to enable us to tell that, those, those stories. Um, so for you, I mean, that's a real missing narrative. So for you to be a pioneer in that respect and to you know, forge ahead with menswear, I mean, how, how difficult is that as a challenge as a black woman as well? How do you, how do you navigate that space? And, and you know, well, how do you do it? Um. I, I would say that the difficult thing about doing menswear is that it's always like people always ask, why menswear? Like, why, why not women's wear? And I don't think they ask men that about anything that they do in fashion. Um, and I guess, like, even in terms of like leading an actual brand as well, too, being a woman is like um, a very, like, a non anonymy sort of thing. So it's very, it's, it is a lot of pressure, I would say. It is a lot of pressure because it's like um, just looking in terms of like who I guess came before that is is like really hard. But of course, like um, seeing people like yourself as well too, you very very much have inspired me. So I was like, if I can exist, then um, or if well, Oswald can exist, then I can exist as well too. But um, I think I was just a very much a determined person. I think even uh, the conversations that we used to have as well too. And like maybe that might be a bit of a difficult space to kind of navigate, but I, um, I always want people to know that the most important part of myself is my my design work, and I never wanted that to come before that before anything else. Um, so I've always just tried to put that ahead of me. Um, and I guess the questions do get boring sometimes, like why menswear. But I just, I just like, oh, you know what, it is what it is. But a lot of um, women designers as well too say that when they go for interviews, they get asked the same question. If they are designing for a menswear brand, they're like, there was the first question is why do you do menswear and like why not women's wear? And it's just like, if a man is being interviewed, it's never asked the same question. So it, I'm hoping to just inspire the next generation that it will just become less of a. Yeah, I, I mean, there Economy, are, yeah. you know, th th there is this obvious change happening. Um, there are kind of, in Martin Rose and Grace Wills Bonner as well. Um, so we have, you know, a real, you know, troop of, of um, you know, shapers, tomorrow's shapers. Um, I'm going to move on to storytelling, which is the hub of this kind of conversation. And you both still tell, you both, um, tell stories through clothes. So how important is culture and heritage um, to the creative di design process and, and the making process as well? So I'm going to ask you that first, actually, Bianca. So the, the trying to tell these stories about culture and heritage and including that kind of making process as well. Um, I, I think when I've ever explored like culture and heritage, I always look back at pictures like family photographs and, and those sort of things. And that's really been a huge inspiration for me. But um, I think it's been more a stepping out of like not 
making what is expected of what, oh, this is what they made from the past. This is, this is how I'm trying to move it into the future. Um, so not the, the same trousers that I might have seen in the actual photograph. I'm going to explore exactly, let's create a new shape or like, um, and have like touch points of influence to that. And that's, that's usually how I've kind of like tackled, um, tackled it. Um, but it's, I, my heritage is, is such a big part of like my inspiration and it's what even keeps, keeps me very much vibrant and I guess exciting. Oswald, um, culture and heritage is like, we can see it all the way through your work. I think um, your later work is even more, you know, forging that, that kind of relationship um, how important is it to you to continue to establish that connection? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, I think with my work, it's always been in there. You know, when I started, obviously demonstrating your cultural roots in an obvious way in your work put you in a very particular box, and so uh, I devised a series of techniques of doing it so I wouldn't be right. Not that, that uh, you know, my cultural roots were an issue for me, no. But it was also about placing my positioning to make a difference, see? So uh, I would say over this 30, 40 year career, the last, I would say, seven years, maybe seven years, where I've realized that, you know, that I just got to a point where I wasn't going to be uh, so quiet about it or so subtle about it. I was going to be really clear. So I came up with this concept uh, of you know, uh, Africanism, right? And so you know, what does that mean? And so I actually made a little short film about that that basically showed what that could be. Like, it's almost like the, the, the African aesthetic. You know, what does that look like, sound like, feel like? And so uh, I started that concept in, I thought it had to come out of Africa, so I did a big show in, in Lagos. And then um, I've kind of divided it into like five chapters. So then I did another show in uh, New York at the Harlem Apollo. Uh, that was called AI, but not AI in the terms we define it as, it's AI, which is basically authentic identity. Yeah. So I kind of played with the letters and made you think about them differently. And then um, more recently I did a show beginning of last year, which was called Black AI, and I did that at the Savoy Theatre. And each one of these shows, the shows were more than just, I'm selling clothes down the, you know, the catwalk. There were multifaceted experiences showing the culture. So there'll be usually a film presented, there'll be artists performing, singing, spoken word, fusion. And, uh, and it was basically a, a celebration of the culture. The reason, the, I think I would say, um, the last show I did at the Savoy Theatre was definitely um, inspired by this whole, the, the Black Lives Matter position. Because I thought, well, here in the UK, we haven't really defined all the black culture, right? All the, the, the faces. And so I thought it was important to do a show that sort of celebrated that, not just the old, but also the young. And so there was a display of names and visual images that came on the screen Why I had this amazing drama called Use of Days perform that kind of was a celebration of all that. So that's why I'm very uh, happy what you've done with the Missing Fred, because it's, you know, I had Jazzy B, you know, DJ at the beginning, and then I did, uh, I got this amazing gospel choir to sing back to life at the end with Idris and, you know, the 100 models at the end. So I totally understand what you are doing with this show. And I'm very impressed by the execution because, you know, I came... Thank you. I came, uh, you know, I came when it wasn't clear how you are going to do it. And I came on the opening day. It was like a queue around the block. So, um, yeah, no, I was, very, was I, was very, I was very happy for you, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Oswald. Thank you. Um, I, I've got to say that you know we're very proud of the show. Um, so and oh, and actually one other thing. Um, and Joe Casey Hayford, that room. Yeah. Yeah, because um, again, you know, 
you know, like I said, I started in the early 80s, and so of course I know Joe, right? And Joe uh, gone through the traditional format because you know I'm self-taught, and so uh, I recognized what his skill set was from the beginning, and always felt that the accolades that he should have received mm. hadn't. Mm. So it was really good to see that you dedicated that space and sort of mobilize everyone's eyeballs to understand the talent of this man. Well, it was a big announcement today um, with Joe Casley Hayford um, receiving a, uh, an achievement award, um, finally. So, I mean, that, that, so we're definitely en route. Um, and for me, I think that legacy is really important to um, the future and people like Bianca. Um, the next part is around cultural ele elegance, and both of you explore cultural elegance in a slightly different way. Uh, you're both drawn to menswear, um, and there's an elegance to your work, a sartorialism to your work that exists. Where do you think that resonates from? Two kind of, you know, two different generations, um, different cultural heritage, but the black experience and that kind of intrinsic style, where does it, where do you think it resonates from? Um, I guess being Caribbean, so being Jamaican, like, um, like very traditional in terms of like looking your best and feeling your best and also wearing the, the best clothes is something that I think has been ingrained into me. Um, and I guess my mum and my dad always like, as long as you have like a really good pair of shoes, it's always better to spend a little bit extra. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think those those things have really like um, been ingrained in me. But I feel like um, I've always been interested in like um, like historical references and like um, dressing from the past, and that's something that I've had to kind of infuse that into like the future and um, making something a bit more like chic and sophisticated is something that I, is my my I don't know I guess natural like taste level of what I've been interested in. And for you, Oswald, I've got a question about, about tailoring. I mean, conceptually, like we, we've had this sure. conversation. Yeah. How do you define it? What would, what's your definition of tailoring? And, and not just the cloth and the cut, but I mean, what does it do? I, I mean, so the thing is, is when I started, um, I actually coined a term, new term, which was called bespoke couture, which was a fusion of two worlds. So one was uh, understanding how to fit and the cut, and then the other... In the, with the bespoke and the couture was basically design at the highest level. So, you know, so tailoring was something I didn't actually use very much as language, you know, because you know I saw it as a much greater thing. But for me, it's always enhancing the wearer. You know, you know, as I've designed over the years, I've realized more and more because. My initial position, you know, when I started, you know, like you started like last few years, is I just wanted to make beautiful clothes for men, right? And so there were certain rules that I knew how to do, which was the proportion, the balance, sleeve head hold, uh, sleeve head hold, roll, and uh, the definition of the waist, the hip, the, the shoulder, waist, hip measurements. There's a way to cut that's flattering, that affects the length, of the jacket, and so I expected those rules. But as uh, time evolved, I realized actually I'm doing something else. Because I'm all about, you know, you come in and you feel better about who you are, right? That's always been wanting you to feel the best of you, with being you confidence. Let's say, you know, I'm very confident in who I am, and so I always want everyone to feel confident in who they are, and also, Encourage them, to, encourage them to be more of themselves. And so clothing, for me, uh, and the way I designed it, was always about that. And so, yeah, so tailoring is, I mean, almost a little bit too simplified, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a section in the show which explores tailoring and, and conceptually. So, mm. you know, the idea of um, aspiration or the idea mm. of protection. Um, and again, I think that relates directly to the black experience. Mm. Um, needing to exactly to you know to look after yourself you know to um make sure that you can assimilate into society and this is particularly in that that kind of 70s 80s oh period. absolutely absolutely um, we talked in depth on the phone 
about our, our, our experiences. And so, you know, it's not an accident I chose the suit. You know, I, I knew what it meant. And if I could find a way to redefine what that means, then, you know, not just create a protection for me, but for anyone who put the suit on. You managed to do that. Right, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time. I know we are, uh, because Debo's looking at me. Um, but um, Bianca, um, the dance floor, this is part nine, by the way. I skipped two parts in the middle, though. But this is part nine, the dance floor. So nightlife and music is a reoccurring theme in, in black style and culture. Jazzy B called it the, the catwalk. He called it the, the club is the catwalk. I can't agree, I can't um, disagree with him. So different generations, but music is often central to mm. your work. Um, does your work respond specifically to any movements, musical movements, Bianca? And is there a kind of a soundtrack to your life that's either present or past? Um, yeah, music has de is definitely like a big part of like my, I guess, my world in terms of like the, the brand. Um, I guess one season I did, which was based on like dance or culture. So like I created these booths where it was five like different models in like these booths and I wanted to kind of be like a peep show. So like, um, the dance hall experience is very much like very much raw and like it's always a woman in the front of the the video camera and I was like let's just have like men just dance by themselves and it didn't mean that they had to do the best dance as well being it was about being confident in the clothes and like expressing themselves so then we did this like um oh gosh it was like a, a casting and it was like the models were just so shocked <laughs> which was actually hilarious but some people were really confident in it and some people weren't um, but it was about expression and that's essentially what my brand, it's what I want people to feel when they wear my, my clothes. So I think having that element of like the freeness of um, dance or culture in, in the brand is essentially what I was looking for. Music, Oswald. Music, I mean, music is almost essential in the, the, the landscape of uh, my work because, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm when I think about even Jazzy B, I need to go to this place called the African Center. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what year that was, but I mean, it was probably like 18, 19 at the time. And so, um, and I needed to go there wearing my suits, you know, and no one else was wearing suits at that time. So, uh, so I, I really recognize that you can have a very defined uh, um, sort of style and that time was also about being individual and, and kind of, and the music kind of encouraged you to be your better self. I mean, yeah, so when I think about the music backdrop, I mean, I can think of lots of people that I know. I mean, like Massive Attack was massive for me. I mean, that's the soundscape to that, you know, uh, it's kind of like a soundscape for the 90s for me, massive. But, uh, you yeah, know, music is always, always, I mean, you know, my fashion shows that I do, and I've done quite a few now, I quite literally sit in the studio uh, with a, a music coordinator defining what the music scape is gonna be like. I'm that, I'm that keen on the understanding of the flow of the sound as it relates to my clothes. Okay, um, have we got any, have we got time for some questions, Debo? Okay, great. So. Just a quick debrief then. For me, um, what's really important is, is this idea of legacy. So what do we leave behind? Um, and what is that kind of enduring um, legacy as well? So, you know, Oswald's legacy is still growing. Bianca's legacy is, is beginning to grow. And I think you're, again, as trailblazers, it's really important to, to understand that, that, that it's not um, a simple path. It's really not, and mm. even now, um, you know, you're inspiring people. Um, you know, at, at university, you know, people are pulling out Bianca Saunders imagery. You know, and I'm going, oh wow, that's Bianca Saunders. I taught her once. So, you're creating your own path. And then the other thing is intergenerational conversation. So, there's actually kind of three generation of designers here um, having a conversation, and I think that's really inspiring. Um, for everyone and for the, the people coming behind us. And maybe even there's people in front of us, you know. So 
Um, so connecting and joining the dots is really important. I think that's a good moment to stop. Is that correct? Okay, so listen. <laughs> you actually beat me to it, I was going to say. Thank you, Oswald. Thank you, Bianca. Round of applause. <laughs>